Uh, welcome everyone, I'm glad you're here. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Matt Springer. I'm the Assistant Extension, Special, or Assistant Extension Professor of Wildlife Management uh, within the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at UK. Uh, I'm also the State Wildlife Extension Specialist. Um, some familiar names out there. Uh, Chelsea, it's good to see you here. Andrew, um, some of the students uh, as well. I'm glad you're all here. Um, I hope that uh, this is not the only uh, Tree Week event that you've made, but if it is, um, I, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Uh, there's been several other awesome uh, events and, and talks, uh, and I encourage you that if you weren't able to make um, most of them um, this year to, to look forward and pay attention to uh, everything they have planned for, for next year's Tree Week. Um, with that, um, I'm gonna, share my screen here and, and, and get going on uh, the topic at hand. Oh. I am hoping everyone is seeing my screen uh, and the presentation. All right, so for today, um, what I was hoping to, to focus on talk about for tree week uh, is this idea and link between wildlife and trees um, with a lot of folks being in favor of wildlife enjoy having wildlife species around um, talking about how can you do that how can you attract wildlife to an area using trees uh, but also understanding that if you bring wildlife you could potentially bring problems along with them uh, as several of our wildlife species um, can cause some trouble per se so a uh, great example here is, although it's not a, a native tree uh, to Kentucky, uh, is one that is grown for agricultural purposes, apple trees. Obviously, that uh, food source uh, will attract a lot of different wildlife species to it, uh, some of which can very easily consume a large portion of apples or break a lot of the branches of the tree, uh, which would cause you problems in producing apples in the future as well. So um, that's kind of there to set the, the stage for, for this talk. As many of you already know, um, or can guess, uh, about half of Kentucky is covered in trees, forests. Um, it's just under half. Uh, and if you look, the vast majority of that is, is concentrated uh, in the eastern part of the state and around the Knobs region. Uh, however, it's, it's pretty well wide distributed. Um, uh, throughout, you know, this, the central bluegrass uh, and all the way out into, into western Kentucky um, and up against the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. Uh, so with that in mind, um, many of our wildlife species really do depend on forests and trees uh, to survive, uh, to go about their daily activities, to, to go about their seasonal activities. Um, and you know, that, that ranges from, from tiny little um, wildlife species like the spring peeper that you'll find uh, potentially on a branch calling uh, in March and April uh, to the eastern newt that you'll see commonly walking through the, you know, forests uh, in eastern Kentucky uh, to something like the ruby-throated kinglet or, um, that we have that um, is probably migrating through right now and potentially some of your yards. Uh, that is using treetops as part of that uh, trip. And, you know, that's, we're not limited to these smaller species. Uh, if you go and look at some of the larger uh, animals that we have that also depend on, on uh, trees for survival, um, you know, black bears, uh, elk, um, heavily depend on mast uh, that is produced by trees for their food source. Black bears will den readily inside of large hollow trees and snags, um, and then up, upwards to, you know, your birds, golden eagles, bald eagles will commonly uh, use trees as a, a roosting location or a hunting um, point um, uh, as well. So many species in Kentucky um, really heavily rely on, on trees for a lot of their activities. And how animals and how wildlife use those trees really does come down to each individual species. It depends on how they use those trees and how important that tree is to them. There are, are species of, of um, grassland birds that will primarily only use trees during migration, but if they don't uh, survive migration, 
they're not going to be around uh, in the summer uh, to use the grasslands to breed uh, and, and have hopefully more grassland birds for the next generation. So it, it just depends. And if, you know, you're trying to potentially uh, manage for a certain wildlife species, you have to understand how that species uses trees. Um, if you're thinking about trying to either plant trees or manage forests to promote that wildlife species. So I just gave you an example of how, you know, grassland birds only use that for a very small component of their, their annual life cycle. Uh, others depend heavily on trees. Uh, for example, the rough grouse, which isn't doing so great in Kentucky, unfortunately, is basically a early successional forest obligate. And if it does not have early successional forests there, it will not survive. So they spend their entire life basically in uh, forests and early successional habitat. And if it's not there, they are not you will not find grouse in that location. So it, it does really range in spectrum on, on reliance on trees uh, and, and how you then potentially could manage to promote those species. Birds are, are a great example to think about the, the wide spectrum. You know, I've given a couple examples already, uh, but in terms of, of having the biggest impact on the most wildlife species, um, we have almost 350 total species uh, species of birds that use Kentucky. Uh, about 150 of them are breeding species, uh, while about 200 migrate through or are winter or summer residents. Um, while, you know, the example I use for grassland birds of, of you know, maybe roosting in trees, um, a vast majority of them are, are using those trees for, for one or more uh, things they need to meet um, their survival. Uh, that could be eating mast, it could be eating insects, it could be using them as a structure for their nests to keep their young and, and eggs safe from predators uh, or protect them from the elements. Um, it could be um, simply uh, used uh, in, in protection of storms if they're, you know, as thermal cover. Uh, so it could be a very temporary thing or, or very um, a, a daily occurrence, even an hourly or, or, or minute occurrence. So what I kind of focused on there is, is, is some of the benefits that um, birds get from trees. Uh, but for the most part, what do, wild, uh, what do trees provide wildlife? Well, like I said, it depends on the species and that's a common thing you hear in wildlife mansion in general, but it can be broken down into, into a couple of different categories. First and foremost, you can get into food and water. So Trees, um, because of, of the relationship they have with insects, right? So we have many insects that, that will um, only exist on certain plant species. They're, they're, they're tied to that species. Think, think monarch and, and uh, milkweed. Um, some are more tightly tied than others. And we have some generalists that will exist on many plants. But in general, there's a lot of insects that um, specialize on utilizing many of our tree species. For example, oaks uh, support the uh, most number of uh, moth and butterfly species, uh, particularly the larva, right? Not necessarily the actual um, adult stages, but they're, they're providing a food source and a host plant uh, for the larval stages. Um, and those larval stages are incredibly important to many of our bird and mammal species as food uh, for growing young, right? So a lot of our bird species annual cycles and um, breeding cycles are tied to the emergence of, of larval caterpillars uh, because they're so high in calorie and fat and protein. They, may, they allow the, the, the um, new birds uh, after they hatch to grow so fast uh, and get to uh, the point where they can fly and, and avoid predators. Um, so insects really though not directly tied to a tree um, in some ways, right? Trees are not actually the insect food sources are necessary to have insects present to be the food source for wildlife. Then we get to the part where the trees actually produce their own food source for wildlife, right? Mast, the, uh, which is basically um, either hard mast or soft mast is a, um, seed component for the tree. And it could be something like acorns. It could be, uh, in this example, cherries. 
Um, but you have things like plums, persimmons, all over the board. And that is all food that is directly uh, available to many of our wildlife species and that are heavily dependent on some of them um, for getting through parts of the year. Currently, right, if you go walking in the woods, we have a ton of acorns that are falling, especially out of white oaks, it seems this year. Um, and those will be keyed in upon by many different um, species of, of wildlife, including deer, elk, bear. Um, if it's um, small, some of the smaller oaks that, uh, or smaller acorns that are produced by oaks, you can have things like blue jays and crows, um, definitely rodents, chipmunks, mice, all of those animals are keying in on this major food source right now because it's such a high value to them as they prepare for uh, their, their winter scarcity. Those are kind of, you know, the two main things that are provided in terms of food. Now, the tree itself can be consumed um, by some species like beavers, uh, deer, elk will browse upon, on, upon the, the tree uh, branches and the buds the leaves, um, but there's fewer species that actually benefit from that. The other thing that trees will provide outside of food uh, is this idea of cover. Now, what cover is, is basically anything that increases survival uh, of, of the species, uh, decreases energy use uh, for them uh, to avoid things like predation uh, or avoid extreme weather events. Uh, and the way trees can do this is a couple things, right? So you have center picture there where you have a, a pileated woodpecker that's creating a cavity uh, where they can either, in, in this sense, they could be potentially uh, nesting in, but they also can then roost at night inside that cavity to, to gain protection from owls as predators uh, or uh, thermal uh, regulation where, you know, maybe it's a cooler night, they are a little bit more insulated inside that cavity of the tree. Other ways uh, trees provide cover for wildlife. Um, obviously, salamanders, that long-tailed salamander that's at the top picture there, they are not going to hide inside the tree um, unless that tree is on the ground as a, a dead snag or, or da uh, down woody debris, uh, in which case they definitely will hide under that tree. Um, but secondarily, the tree when, it, tree, when it loses its leaves right about now in the season, right, all that leaf layer builds up and creates a whole bunch of um, cavities and, and areas for that salamander to then get underneath and, and hide. Uh, also creates some uh, climatic um, conditions that favor the salamander, right, holds moisture in, uh, allows them to, to stay um, um, little bit uh, wetter than uh, say above the leaf litter. Um, so it, it can provide both the cover uh, from predation or, as well as the environmental conditions needed to, to enhance that, that species survival. Thirdly, just having trees present creates visual obscurity. And what visual obscurity, when you think about that, is the ability to see something at a distance. So in that bottom picture there, if you were standing on trail and looking into the woods, the more trees you have present in an area, the more of the area is blocked from being seen at a distance, right? So you have trees that are getting in the way, the leaves are getting in the way, you can only see so far. If you have several large trees with no canopy underneath, you can see a lot further than say you have a lot of young trees that are very tightly packed together. So the presence and the number and size of those trees can actually uh, create a condition where it's hard to see wildlife species within that area. Um, birds will you know, be able to disappear into that tightly packed canopy. Um, if it's a larger tree, the same thing exists at the top of the tree, right? In the, in the, the branches where all the leaves are, um, which then disappears in the winter. So there's not as much cover present for those in that situation. However, if you have a tightly packed um, stand of saplings, uh, even in the winter when the leaves go away, you still have that, that ability uh, to prevent um, animals from being seen by predators uh, and also blocks environmental um, um, situations like a blizzard or an ice storm um, from you know wearing on that animal if it's inside it. So the actual presence or the type of tree that's there, the number of trees there all provide a different cover benefit to wildlife. 
the trees themselves um, can you can get a little more specialized in, in what they provide, right? So we talked about that pileated woodpecker creating that cavity in the tree. Well, if it was spring, uh, more than likely that cavity is being used as a nesting structure on top of a place to hide from predators. Uh, just the presence of a tree and providing limbs and branches um, and you know maybe sticks that have fallen off that tree, branches that have fallen off that tree, actually provide either nesting structure to build the nest or a place to build it upon. Um, so there's a secondary benefit there um, to the reproduction for many wildlife species. Um, this same holds true uh, not only for, for nesting in terms of birds, um, but you know you sometimes get um, bark uh, from you know certain hickories. You get the, the shag bark hickory there. It has a lot of structures um, within uh, the bark that creates environments underneath it that things like um, bats can actually have a maternity colony in the tree itself or put their um, pups in that tree as they move them around to, to help protect them. Uh, so in, in a way, it's providing that reproductive structure needed uh, for the species. On top of that, if it was just um, the bat by itself, uh, and not a pup, so not a young bat, we would call that just roosting structure, which is basically uh, another benefit provided. It's a, it's a slightly different benefit. It's not necessarily reproductively um, related, but it's one that is necessary for a lot of species to rot. Bats need to find areas that protect themselves during the day from hot air in the summer or cold in the winter. They can find that in um, places and cracks in trees and, and, and whatnot, uh, cavities in trees. Birds kind of do the same thing where you'll see them uh, especially taking advantage of, of the cavities and trees as you see that chickadee in the top there poking his head out. Um, as well as some of our larger birds like turkeys who if they stayed on the ground uh, at night would be at a higher risk for predation. So instead they actually spend the night in the treetops because there's far fewer predators that can actually take, adva take advantage of them uh, being in the treetops than there is on the ground. Um, basically gray horned owls would be the only thing they would need to worry about up in the tree and they tend to um, not actually attack them in trees. Uh, whereas if they were on the ground, you'd have coyotes, bobcats, um, foxes uh, that all could potentially uh, try to uh, depredate them on the ground. So you have um, basically roosting habitat, right? Places that they can get up off the ground and, and hide or be safe uh, from uh, predation. Finally, we have this other category, other, other ways trees get used by wildlife that helps um, them survive, reproduce. Um, we get some, some odd ones. Um, so the rough grouse that I mentioned is the forest obligate. One of the things it does uh, that if it's not present uh, on the landscape is it, it has a hard time reproducing or finding mates is uh, they need what's called a drumming log. So it's basically a, a larger tree um, that's on the ground, fell to the ground, that's in the middle of a, a um, younger forest. They will, the males in um, early spring, late winter, will get on top of that log and beat their wings at such a high rate, it produces a, a thumping sound, a drumming sound um, that alerts females in the area to the presence of the male and the, the territory that he's defending. Uh, to hopefully then uh, mate with him or him with her uh, and have um, successful reproduction that year. If grouse are not able to have drumming logs, they have a hard time finding mates uh, because they exist in very thick early successional forests. Therefore, it's harder to see uh, each other and find each other. Um, so it's a, it's a vital component of the reproductive cycle. Uh, other things uh, we see, you know, trees being used for in terms of um, purchase for hunting, right? So herons uh, will, will consistently use trees uh, around water to uh, reach in and uh, grab fish. Uh, same holds true for things like our birds of prey, hawks, um, falcons, owls. They all will utilize uh, the structure that's present in a tree uh, to survey for prey uh, without having to consistently be flying around or soaring around, which is a, a higher en energy expenditure. We get into some, some things that um, mammals will do. 
uh, where we have, and probably the, the, the best known one for, for a mammal activity with a tree uh, that's unique is beavers and the use of trees and, and uh, logs, uh, branches to build their dams uh, and their um, they um, will also have their lodges uh, that will be built out of the same materials. Uh, but you know, the reason they do that is they're, they're trying to dam up the water uh, to flood an area, which makes it easier for them to access more trees to increase the size of the dam and also get to the branches uh, and the younger uh, growth parts of the trees as food uh, and that which they will store in the flooded water if they're further north uh, for a uh, winter food catch. Uh, so it's a pretty unique behavior as associated with trees. And there's many more out there. Um, but those are a, a few that um, I'd like to highlight. Now, what can you do to, to help wildlife as it relates to trees? Well, there's a lot. Um, and, it, you know, and you don't have to own a big piece of property to, to have um, a positive impact on wildlife species um, by managing or planting trees. First and foremost, what you can you can do um, is you know basically good uh, either forest management practices or good landowner practices where you can either plant trees, take care of the trees you have that way they're the healthiest, um, providing the most food to wildlife species, or are keeping them up as as a uh, structure that will uh, be in place for them to you know use as cover, a roost, those kind of things. If you wanna plant trees um, or manage for trees, if you have larger properties, the things you need to be thinking about are any native tree will provide a resource or resources to uh, at least one, but usually a lot of different wildlife species, right? So service berry here, and this one in particular has a ton of food that's available to um, many wildlife species. Uh, at that point in time. Now, the tree itself, usually if it is alive and producing food, is also providing that roosting structure, the cover, and so on. So the big thing to be that if you want to try to check a box off, um, you at least want to check something associated with food or cover, right? Um, and for the most part, any native tree will provide at least that. The key, though, in general, is you want to try to, to check off as many boxes as you can as you manage a property or as you're planting trees. Um, so if you are choosing, um, there's many tree species that don't necessarily produce a lot of mast that gets is favorably viewed upon um, by wildlife. Um, in general, though, you usually have insects that will use that tree. So uh, tulip poplar, for example, is not one that there's a lot of, of, of mass that gets used um, by wildlife species on that, uh, but it has plenty of insects that utilize it, which then get picked up by um, birds and bats and so on. Um, you know, you can get lucky here where you have this, this neat little uh, situation where you have birds that nest in trees, and generally their birds are a lot less picky about um, where they build their nests as long as it's near food resources and protected uh, from predators. So, um, that's the one thing that they'll actually consistently use non-native species for, um, things like autumn olive, uh, honeysuckle, buckthorn, um, all of those because of their nature being really thick, they provide a lot of cover and um, birds will take advantage of that, especially things, birds like uh, cardinals, doves, robins, uh, catbirds, um, they like those, those situations and, and do quite well in them. Um, so in some ways, you know, they have learned to adapt to, to the invasives and non-natives we have just because of, of their general nature of being a generalist. But none of those species really um, support the insect life that is kind of the bottom of the biomass chain, right, in terms of the food chain. The more native plants we have around, the more biomass is, is created through insects and the more food that's then available on, on up. So, Though non-natives are, are serving a, a function in terms of the survival of those wildlife species, the natives are, are completing, um, completing what should be uh, provided to that system. So that's really why if you're going to plant something, you know, despite 
um, some benefits that may be provided, you want to be trying to, to prioritize those native species for the area and choose the tree that is um, going to do the best in, in the location that you try to plant it, right? Um, so you don't want to plant a, 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 um, a, a, an upland oak species in the middle of a swamp. It's not going to do well. Um, just as low, a willow in the middle of a, a oak hickory forest is not going to do great if there's not a whole lot of water around. So pick the right native species for the right location um, to provide the best benefit to the wildlife that are using the area. So some ideas on um, species that you should, should be thinking about using uh, that are, are great for wildlife. Um, and these are really broken down by, by our food that they provide. Uh, or the thermal benefits they provide. As I mentioned, um, you know, oaks are a great species to plant, uh, mostly because A, they provide a lot of mast uh, as they, they reach um, larger sizes, uh, but they also are great in terms of insect life and, and the diversity of insects they support, uh, which really benefit things like birds and bats. The um, other hard mass species, hickory, beech, uh, are all great as well. Hickories, especially great um, shagbar hickories for um, bat species uh, or forest bat species because the, the uh, bark structure that they have uh, is really good for those daytime roosting sites uh, for them and that they use um, as well, you know, during the day, but as well as they're uh, foraging at night. Soft mass species, right? So it's not great to have one um, version of food. You want to have a diversity uh, of, of food sources, uh, as well as a diversity of host plants for insects um, and leafy material that can be consumed. Uh, so having, you know, a little bit of both is a great thing um, because a lot of times that hard mass isn't available till the fall, whereas uh, soft mass is available in uh, late spring, uh, and summer. So making sure there's food during the entire time um, of the year is a, is a challenge sometimes, but um, by diversifying what species you use and plant in an area, you can help accomplish that. So great soft mass producers uh, are sumacs, our service berries, dogwoods, mulberries, uh, and persimmons. Uh, each of these, you know, are uh, sumacs, service berries, and dogwoods. Um, are really going to favor your bird species, uh, whereas the mulberries and persimmons um, are, you know, the mulberries will be birds as well, but also will attract a lot more of the mammals uh, into the area, um, and persimmons especially will attract a lot of the mammals. Now, there's, you know, are a few of our pines and cedars, uh, and they should not be overlooked for their benefits. Um, you have, you know, several of them will produce berries and seeds uh, that are used, especially by uh, many of our bird species. Um, but one of the best things that they do provide, especially if you have a stand of pines and cedars, uh, cedar is especially good at this, is the thermal cover um, that they are able to create uh, in a thicket um, really does, um, in extreme weather events, provide wildlife a great sanctuary to try to get out of those events and, and increase their survival uh, and lessen that wear and tear from, from dealing with cold or, or rain um, on them. So they're a good thing to, to, especially the more proper you have, to try to work into a situation, um, not necessarily for the food, but definitely for the cover component. You will have almost every um, species of wildlife will use cedars and pines at one point or another during the year uh, because of the, the benefits they provide. And, you know, we're, we're going to kind of transition out of, of, you know, trees and wildlife and managing and, and, and promoting them a little bit, but um, resources that are out there that, you know, especially for smaller um, backyards, uh, smaller properties that, that kind of frame things in a great way to think about how you can um, promote wildlife in an area. Um, Gardening for Birds by my predecessor, Tom Barnes, uh, is a great resource, uh, especially for trying to, to plan to promote birds in, in a smaller area. Um, and then just in general, thinking about, you know, native plants and, and 
uh, how we can try to offset some of the damage that we do during development with landscaping. Um, Doug Tallamy from the University of Delaware has a couple books out. Um, his newest one's Nature's Best Hope. And it's a, a great read to kind of think about um, every little thing you do in, on, on, on your property and, and what that, you know, it, the impacts they're having on the entire system um, based on just your decisions in terms of plants. So great resources. Now, you go about trying to attract wildlife, plant a whole bunch of native uh, of trees and, and you know, it, other native landscaping, and you get wildlife. Um, that's great, and I really hope you do that. There's um, just one thing. Wildlife are, are going to take advantage of resources, and you, know, you may be putting things out with a plan in mind for how they're going to use it, they're not always going to follow that plan. What they see is um, resources there that help them survive or reproduce. And how they use those resources cannot be controlled in all settings. You may attract things to, to areas of your property or, or your house that you never wanted. You know, you may have birds nesting in your gutters or um, swallows that start putting a nest up right by your door, raccoons that were attracted by um, the berry trees you put in your yard are now finding trash cans and causing an issue there, or they're getting into your garden. Deer are finding that your landscape tastes really good because it's the native plants that they evolved to eat. Uh, and yet your garden is right there next to it and also has some delicious things. Um, so many things can happen. Um, and the, the most dreaded of all, as I hear it, although I don't agree with it, is you create habitat that may cause a snake to show up. Uh, because you have rodents that are using, using these areas. Uh, you're creating cover for them. So there are some things you have to be prepared for if you start creating wildlife habitat. The best thing you can do is try to deal with or plan for some potential common issues so that if they do happen, you have a plan in place, or maybe you can even stop them from happening beforehand um, based on how you, you manage your property or how you plant those trees or what trees you're going to plant. So how do we do that? How do we get on the front side of it? Well, as you start managing your property or trying to plant trees and promoting wildlife, um, you should come up with a way of, of trying to understand, okay, if I plant this tree, I may have this kind of wildlife species come in. This is what I'm hoping to see. Uh, how, how may they start using my property uh, in addition to what I'm creating for them? Well, um, the thing that you need to think about is um, more than likely most folks don't want wildlife near or inside their house uh, because the, the amount of damage uh, that can occur if, say, um, you know, a squirrel or a raccoon gets into your attic or your, your uh, crawl space uh, can be immense and costly. So a little bit of, of me space that isn't for wildlife isn't necessarily a bad thing because uh, the last thing you want to do is do all the work and spend money and time on, on making a wildlife friendly yard. And then all of a sudden, all you're doing is dealing with problems in your house or around your house because the wildlife are there. So if you need to create a buffer that is um, slightly un, uh, less appealing to wildlife, that's okay. Um, that's especially true when you start talking about larger properties. So creating an area that is less appealing. So the top picture there, whereas you have a little bit of lawn and lawn is not great for wildlife, but lawn is good at trying to create a buffer from wildlife where you have lots of trees and forests and habitat that's immediately adjacent to your buildings, your barn, your house is going to have less problems than say this house in the bottom picture where there's tree branches all over the, you know, over the top of the house, giving easy access to the roof. You have cover immediately next to the house um, with very little lawn. It's great for wildlife in terms of, of, of habitat that you're creating, but it, it opens the door to potential problems. So as you plan, right? So you can try to create a buffer, but you can also think about what trees you wanna plant. Um, and, you know, there, I, I talked about those the soft mass producers and the benefits that they provide. Well, a lot of the berries um, 
and fruiting plants and trees tend to attract a little bit more of the unwanted species or the problem species like squirrels and raccoons, uh, groundhogs, because it's a highly favorable food for them. They're very good at finding it. Um, so you, you know, if you put a mulberry tree right next to your back door, which is not a great place for a mulberry tree, you will have squirrels and raccoons and groundhogs immediately next to your house and trying to stay as close to as possible to that food source. So you may get a groundhog that digs a, a tunnel underneath your house, uh, potentially causing foundational issues over time. So thinking about where you potentially place that tree or what tree you want to choose. So instead of maybe a, a soft mass tree right next to your house, you could potentially choose a hard mass tree, which are less likely to have uh, raccoon issues. And um, unfortunately, squirrels kind of like everything. Um, so you may still have a squirrel issue. Um, you also potentially then have raining hard mass onto your house. Um, so the bigger point here is a little bit of thought and, and knowing what you're trying to produce can potentially slow down a problem from happening or at least prepare you for it to expect it to happen and, and try to deal with it from there. So um, next to houses, I think one of the best things you can put immediately next to your house um, are things like pollinator plants, your, your smaller flowering plants, milkweed, uh, bee balm, um, cone flowers, because uh, they tend to attract a lot of, of, of butterflies, but they also tend to attract a lot of the birds, which usually don't create as many um, problems uh, in and around the houses as mammals do. Trying to keep, you know, that space that's around your house, around buildings as tidy as possible, uh, as least uh, peeling as possible wildlife will help deal with uh, those problems um, and, and try to keep and deter animals from using that space near your house or in your house a little bit. Um, access to, to your roof uh, or, or building is a, a big thing. Um, so you want to keep your tree branches uh, about six to 10 feet away from any part of your house. Uh, that's mostly due to the fact that squirrels are really good at jumping and they like to do it. Um, so anything that's about 10 feet or less, a squirrel, given a little bit of speed and a little bit of daring, can act and can and will jump from a branch onto your house. Um, additionally, things like if you have a wood stove or firewood, you want to keep any kind of brush, wood, rock piles um, to a minimum uh, near your house, um, usually at the back end of your property or back end of, of your yard. Um, one, because of termite issues uh, with, you, with uh, what could be living in that wood, uh, but two, because it will attract things like mice, uh, rodents, which will then bring snakes. Uh, it provides cover, a, a wood pile um, or a brush pile, a, a, a rock pile, uh, may attract things for like um, possums, groundhogs that'll den underneath it. Um, you could also see things like skunks, which is never a great thing to walk out in your porch in the dark and have a skunk right there. Uh, doesn't tend to end well uh, sometimes. Um, so trying to keep those, um, what we would call great cover for wildlife, a little bit further away from your house will help um, prevent issues from popping up. Keep your grass mowed, mowed down short. Um, that'll help reduce rodent use uh, of the area. Um, but you're all, you, you know, you're going to probably have rodent problems. Almost everyone does. Uh, it's just a matter of, of being on the lookout for them um, and then try to deal with them as soon as you find them. Now, you may want to have things like um, certain tree species near your house, uh, and, and that's okay. Um, but you know, you can try to prevent um, some issues uh, using uh, exposure devices. Uh, this is especially um, helpful if you find a problem after it's already occurring. Um, so say a squirrel has chewed into your siding uh, or found a gap in your attic, um, you want it to A, get that animal out of there uh, and then B, prevent them from going back in. Um, this is the same is true for things like bats, um, which, you know, you don't want to have a, a, a big bat colony in your attic because of histoplasmosis issues, uh, among other things. Um, rabies is a concern as well. So um, using things like um, 
metal fencing, small, small hold metal fencing um, to keep animals out is great. Uh, rodents like squirrels can't chew through it. Uh, raccoons, as long as it's secured properly, can't, can't pull it away. Uh, and it will hopefully solve problems if there is one uh, or potentially uh, stop one from occurring. Uh, works great on bats as long as it is very small uh, uh, holes and gaps because bats are able to get themselves basically inside of anything uh, dime size or larger. Uh, and, you know, a lot of these little nooks and crannies of houses um, will be places uh, birds will try to nest as well. So it, it kind of prevents a, a couple different problems from happening. Um, so you don't immediately need to jump to a lethal um, a lethal solution, uh, especially given the fact that you're probably trying to attract wildlife to your property. Uh, you can, you know, try exclusion device deterrents, um, you know, owl decoys, snake decoys, those kind of things may be enough to make animals uncomfortable to try to uh, use, utilize a different space. Um, so you do all that work to try to promote wildlife. The last thing you want to do is end up having to deal with, um, solving a problem in your house uh, lethally. Uh, and although sometimes it may have to happen, if you get a large bat infestation, you definitely want to have a professional deal with it because of rabies concerns and also federal, federal um, law issues with potentially being endangered species. The last thing I want to touch on here is um, you're doing, a, if you do a lot of work to attract wildlife to your property, uh, the last thing you want to do is create what we call an ecological sink. Um, so if you have outdoor cats, um, we do not want you to promote wildlife on your property. And that is because cats um, are incredibly good uh, predators and efficient predators, uh, and they do kill for fun. And um, so if you have things like bird feeders or you have um, types of trees and plants that are going to attract especially birds or mam small mammals to an area, and you have an outdoor cat, you're actually going to decrease the population and have a negative impact on the population due to those cats' activities. So we, you know, I, I have cats. Um, I keep mine inside. I know that's very hard in some situations. Um, if you have a cat that you can't keep inside, you know, just don't try to attract wildlife to that area until you do not have that cat around. Um, it's, it's just not, you know, from our viewpoint as a wildlife biologist, morally or ethically a good thing uh, to try to draw animals into potentially a death trap form. So with that, um, other great uh, information that's out there, um, we are, you, Lori Thomas, one of our extension associates here in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources is compiling a website with information on all of our native tree species. Uh, and part of that information includes the, the benefits towards wildlife um, on that, of that species. So it's a great resource. If you're thinking about planting some trees, you can go in there and, and take a look at, at some of our more common trees right now uh, as, uh, and, and determine if it's a good option for, for where you're thinking about planting. Um, Purdue has a wonderful resource in terms of um, picking out hardwood trees and, and what wildlife they benefit. Uh, and then there's also a, a great resource on landscaping for wildlife and picking uh, trees and shrubs and vines that are, are great uh, for your backyard. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to take them now. Uh, or if you want to reach out to me at a later time, um, my contact information is right there. And it is best to, to get me by email uh, as um, sometimes I'm not in the office. So with that, if anybody has any questions, I'll, I'll be happy to take them. All right, quiet group. Even you, Wit. I'm surprised. Well, well folks, I hope that um, you were able to get out and enjoy some of the other tree week events. And like I said, make sure you pay attention for next year and, and try to take advantage of, of um, some awesome learning experiences um, that, that we have going on with, with uh, the community uh, during this week. Related news, uh, next week is um, tree, uh, Forest Products Week. Uh, so it's somewhat um, 
somewhat related uh, as it is a use of trees and all the benefits we get from that. Um, yes, Whit, I will be in my office if you want to talk. Thank you. And uh, everyone have a great weekend. Uh, unfortunately, I just looked out my window and it looks like it's raining. So hopefully that stops here soon. Uh, but thanks for coming uh, and have a great weekend.